Good afternoon. Sandy Adams is a two-time alumni from the University of Memphis with a Master of Arts in Teaching and a Bachelor's in International Relations. Sandy produces two podcasts, The Sandy Adams Show, where she teaches about business life and everything in between. A Southern Girl's View with Sandy Adams that focuses on ordinary people with interesting lives and stories. Sandy's vast experience and 25 plus years of interactions with people from all walks of life and in all facets of the world have demonstrated to her that mindset and motivation are critical to a person's success. Sandy is an award-winning portrait photographer, social media brand strategist, writer, educator, historian, world traveler, and speaker. She recently relocated back to Memphis from Houston and is eager to get involved in the University of Memphis and the Memphis greater community once again. Welcome, Sandy Adams. Thank you, Willie. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. This is a production of the University of Memphis Alumni Association. It's a webinar series. This is the first of four of these. It's called The Art of Motivation in Job Search, and today we're specifically delving into mindset, confidence, and self-esteem. And I am beyond thrilled to be here today. So just take one second to get familiar with Zoom. I have asked that the chat box be open for this presentation. So if you have questions, you can pop them in there. If they are really long and in depth, then I ask that you hold them to the end of the webinar. I'll stop a few minutes before uh, two o'clock so that we can answer, so I can answer some questions then. So look for where the chat screen is. I may be asking you to put what uh, answers in there periodically to keep you involved in the discussion. Uh, your mute control will keep your um, audio off and we ask that you do so. Your video control, if you want to turn it on, you're welcome to do so, um, but you can keep it off as well. You can also resize your presentation screen and you can also do gallery view versus speaker view. A speaker view will keep it on me, gallery view will let you see other people in the class. Right now, I'd love to know where you are watching from today. If you could just pop that into the chat box, I would love to know where you are watching from today. I'm actually about an hour east of Memphis in Hardeman County near the Mississippi State Line. We have Springfield, Tennessee, Chattanooga, South Haven, Bartlett, West Memphis, Memphis, Charlotte, North Carolina, Home office in Memphis, Memphis, love to see that. As Willie said, I just relocated. Houston, Texas, Penelope, I know you. I'm so glad to see you here. Um, lots of people still from Memphis, from South Haven. Again, from Memphis, I love all that. So yes, as Willie said, I, I literally just relocated back up from Houston to Memphis last week. So I'm glad that that move is over and I'm thrilled. Willie and I got this webinar series. We started the discussions earlier in the summer and I'm just thrilled to be presenting these. And at the end of today's webinar, I'll talk about the upcoming three other webinars that I'll be doing uh, for October, November, and December. So I'm thrilled about that. Russellville, Arkansas, welcome. Okay, guys, let's dive into it just a little bit more. I want to talk about my story just for a few minutes because it's actually relevant to mindset, motivation, confidence, and self-esteem, and everything that we're going to talk about, especially related to job search. So my story, as he said, I'm a social media brand strategist. I'm a photographer. I'm a teacher, a speaker, a podcast host, and traveler, but down and dirty all to my essence, I am still a small girl, small town girl from West Tennessee. I grew up on a farm in West Tennessee, about two hours between Memphis and Nashville. And, you know, for me, I'm still, a lot of my essence is still about being that small town girl from West Tennessee. No matter where I've lived, I lived in Memphis for 18 years. I got two degrees there. I lived in Houston for 16 years coming up next month. And I've seen a lot of the world around me, but all in all, I'm still a Tennessee girl at heart. So as he said also, I have two degrees. I actually have one from Memphis State University and I have a degree from the University of Memphis. So that was not planned. It's just the way it worked out. Uh, my bachelor's is in international relations. And if I can say anything about the University of Memphis is that my undergraduate degree really, really opened my eyes to the world. And it really um, inspired me to do so many things. I was 
uh, beyond blessed to have an instructor at the at Memphis State University, Dr. George Kia. That he was fresh off political asylum that he sought here in the United States from Liberia. He's taught at the War College and several other colleges uh, across the country and for the military. And he uh, now is a dean at Texas Southern University, but he was my political science teacher for three years. And he really, really instilled in me uh, and influenced me a lot in how I thought from then on and how I looked at the world from then on. So I am beyond blessed to Memphis State University. I still have a hard time. I go back and forth from Memphis State to U of M. My uh, master's degree is in secondary education, specifically history and government. Uh, I did not end up teaching at the high school level. Um, I, I really wanted to teach in a museum setting. I tried anthropology for one year as a master's student and then decided that I wasn't really up for digging. And I switched to secondary education and I would really love to teach a classes for the University of Memphis. So just putting it out there, guys. Uh, I got most of my business work in the intermodal in uh, transportation industry, the big containers um, that you see on the rail cars, or if you're in Houston, you see on the port, uh, those are intermodal containers. They can actually go through different modes of transportation without having to unload them. I worked in a department called driver services, and I was, I was over 260 plus truck drivers. When I say that to people, they get really like, oh my God, you? Yes. And it taught me everything that I ever needed to know about being in business. It taught me how to talk to people from all educational backgrounds, from different ethnic backgrounds, from different religions, even different languages. And I had to use both my degrees in order to be successful. But I really dealt with them and their repairs on the equipment they were pulling. And I will say that intermodal transportation industry is never, ever boring. And it taught me so much about so many different things. Um, American Heart Association, I talk about this quite a bit if you start following me on social media uh, or uh, also on LinkedIn. I talk about my 20 year volunteer experience with the American Heart Association. I started off as a volunteer in the Memphis community in 2000, uh, working as a company leader for actually Intermodal Cartage Company based there in Memphis. And I got involved with the American Heart Association because of my mom's battle with heart disease. She had Prior to 2000, she had had an emergency triple bypass and it really opened my eyes about heart disease. Truck drivers had it and that's really why I got involved with intermodal cartage as well as my mom. When I moved to Houston, I got back involved specifically with Go Red for Women because heart disease is the leading killer of women uh, more so than any other disease, including all cancers combined. And I used it as an opportunity to show up and make connections and also give back to my community. And I always talk about how volunteering can help you regardless of if you're employed or unemployed. It can help you and it can help the people that you're volunteering with. And everybody, no matter what company they work for or where they are in life, can get something from volunteering. And so I always talk about that as well. And yes, I do, I've already reached out to the Memphis American Heart Association to get back involved. I moved to Houston, Texas in 2004. And then a few years later, after the um, trucking company that my ex and I had been running went under, uh, he told me one day, you really love taking photographs. Why don't you try uh, to be a photographer? And so I literally started with one camera, a small lens, and nothing else. And I looked around me at everyone in the, uh, the Houston area, and there are hundreds if not thousands of photographers. And I thought, I, don't, I can't compete with everybody else. I can't compete with people who have studios that have money for marketing. I had no money, we were in debt, and I had a camera and a short lens, and I had the outside. So I literally just decided not to look at everybody else and I marketed myself in a way that made me stand out. And we'll talk about that a lot in today's episode as well. Uh, the photography helped me with the American Heart Association. I, I literally said, I'll volunteer my photography services. And 10 years later and a huge um, campaign later, uh, I was a huge part of helping them raise over $1 million in the past 10 years. And I'm very, very proud and thankful for that opportunity. Um, from there, I started doing social media branding. And how did I get started in that? Because I had no marketing money. So Facebook back in the early 2000s was just getting started. And I really started looking at how I could show up online. I started a blog, which I still have. My blog actually gets me more contacts than any direct networking ever could. I'm still consistent 
constantly being found online because of my blog posting. I don't post as much as I used to, but I still use that as a form of my marketing. Um, and then uh, Instagram showed up and I started seeing how my background in business could then help other people in different, in small businesses working for themselves, even people in job search, I could help them show up online and teach them how to market themselves online on social media. And when I talk about social media, LinkedIn is also a social media platform. Uh, from there, I got a part-time job working as an instructor for a Houston-based nonprofit called JS101. It's Job Search 101. Um, it's founded by one individual, and I teach there part-time. And what I realized, I teach people how to find a job. I teach them that job boards are not always where it's at, that networking is a huge part of that. We have so many different types of classes, but what I've also learned over the past three years working there is that mindset and motivation um, are a huge part of the job search process and it can actually make or break your job search process and so that's really what we're going to focus on today but all in all I'm still that little girl from a farm in small town Tennessee okay so now let's get started Henry Ford he had a great quote whether you think you can or you think you can't you're right and that's very true however you see yourself is right regardless of what anyone else sees that is always going to be first and foremost. And what does that come down to? It comes down to mindset. So what is mindset? The technical definition in research says it's a mental frame or a lens that selectively organizes and encodes information, thereby orienting an individual towards a unique way of understanding and experience and guiding one towards corresponding actions and responses. I know that's lots of words, right? And it all sounds kind of high tech. So what is it in a nutshell? Mindset is everything. It is everything. It takes control of everything you do, how you act, your beliefs, everything that encompasses your life. Mindset controls everything. It controls how you show up every day. It controls your relationships. It controls your work. It controls your job search even. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So it specifically can affect what you value. It also can affect your corresponding choices that you make. So let's think about that. Um, if you have a mindset of something is not worth doing, that affects how much you value that. So if you think there's no value, let's say in photography, then that's going to affect your cor corresponding choices that you make regarding that. If you think there's no value in you showing up every day on LinkedIn, it's going to affect you're not going to make the choice to show up on LinkedIn. If you think that if you're, if you do not value emailing someone to ask for a job, it's going to affect whether or not you actually do that. And those are just some simplified examples of that. But mindset affects your values and the choices that you make because of that. Mindset plus consistent action equals achieving and sustaining success. A great example I like to use, so I'm gonna use one from Houston and one from Memphis, so let's talk about Houston first. Simone Biles, Olympic gymnast. Her mindset was she wanted to be in the Olympics one day. Her consistent action was showing up every day in the gym, regardless of whether or not she felt like it. She showed up every day. She had consistent action in her training, in her dieting, in her lifting weights, whatever that was, it was consistent with her. And therefore, her mindset, knowing she could do it, and the action of doing it every day, regardless of whether or not she wanted to, gave her and helped her achieve and sustain success. Now, let's look at the Memphis example, Ja Morant. Love Ja Morant, okay? Uh, from South Carolina, went to Murray State for two years, was drafted number two for the Memphis Grizzlies, just awarded Rookie of the Year. In a post interview he had the other day after being awarded that prestigious award, he said that on a draft night, he told his family, I'm going to win Rookie of the Year. So his mindset literally was, I am going to do this. It's not so much about wishing something and making it come true. It's about thinking that it can come true, but following up with consistent action. So he could have stood there at draft night and said, I'm going to win Rookie of the Year and then half-heartedly played through all of his games. 
or made excuses for not scoring enough points or, not, or for not doing enough. But he believed in himself and he consistently showed up every day. He didn't win the very first game he played. I think it was several games later before they got that win. But he still showed up and tried to give his all. And yes, he had days where he didn't play that well. He didn't score the most points. But he consistently showed up. And that, compared with his mindset, helped him achieve success. Now he's motivated even more to do more. So when you have a positive mindset, when you put that with consistent action, and that then instills more motivation in you. So motivation and mindset do go hand in hand, and that's why it's a part of the art of motivation. But consistent action helps establish your mindset and helps really achieve that success. So how is mindset formed? Your thoughts, the corresponding emotions you have with those thoughts, and even images that you have. Those equal your judgment of everything. And we talked about how that is values, your values, and how it uh, then sets the stage for how you perceive other things. So whether or not it's in job search or in life in general, uh, this is how mindset is formed. A lot of children get their mindset from their parents. So believe it or not, if you have parents that have a negative mindset, they're always talking uh, down about things or they're not showing confidence, self-confidence, if they're not positive reinforcements, then the children are also going to have that type of mindset. So believe it or not, mindset can be um, hereditary in some ways. It can be shared and it can, and whether you realize it or not. So if you have children out there, it's important that whether or not you believe you can do something, it's important that you tell your children and help form a positive mindset for them. My mom never really told me I could not do anything. She also wasn't one that said I could do anything. How my mindset was formed but was by watching my mother show up every day whether or not she wanted to. Um, what I didn't talk about was that my dad, if you wanna know where I came from, my dad didn't, could not read or write. He was an alcoholic, D did know his alphabet, but couldn't read or write, could do math in his head. He was a carpenter. He worked for himself. My mom had a high school degree. Uh, she worked in a pajama factory until I was nine years old. There were days that she didn't want to go to work, but she did anyway. So if I want to talk about how my mindset was formed, it was from watching my mother, not necessarily hearing her. It was from watching her. Um, and if you want to know more about, uh, if, if you're asking how could my dad not read or write, uh, it was the sign of the times. And, and strangely enough, my stepfather could not read or write. I also did a podcast on that if you're interested, because adult literacy is still a huge problem in this country as well as worldwide. Choices. Mindset affects your choices. And every day, you have a choice to make. You always have choices. And you may say to yourself, well, I don't have a choice. It's out of my hands. You have a choice how you show up. You have a choice how you believe about yourself. You have a choice of what you say about yourself or what you say about others. You have a choice in every action that you take. You even have a choice as to not have a choice. A friend of mine the other day, uh, she posted something on Facebook. She lives in Arkansas and I, and I think that she's working at, right now she's in a weight loss program. And so she talked about how she really did not want to go out and walk right now because it was really muggy, it was afternoon, she'd had a hard day and she just wasn't feeling going out and walking for an hour in the heat and the humidity. And then she also added to that and she said, I stopped and I thought about the kids at St. Jude, the kids with cancer. They don't have a choice. They, they have to show up for their chemo. Well, they do have a choice. They still have to do it. If they wanna live, they have to do it. And they do it regardless of whether or not they want to or feel up to it. And she said that inspired her to still go out and walk. It was tough to walk in the heat and humidity, but if, that, if those children can show up every day for their chemo, whether they want to or not, whether they feel like it or not, then she can go and do that. So I also talk about first world problems. You know, we're so big on our, our problems that we have each and every day. And I'm not saying that people don't have problems, but what I'm saying is, if you want to talk about mindset and, and you're having a problem or you're having a bad day, sit down and think about and look for other people that have it a little bit rough or have it a little bit harder than you. And then thank God that your problem is really a first world problem. In the scheme of things, it may not be that big. I talk about that a lot, a lot within classes dealing with people in job search. I talk about how 
you know, your problem about not wanting to email somebody or not wanting to network with somebody that, um, in the scheme of things, it's really not that big of a deal. It may be a big deal to you, but in the scheme of things, look at it, step back from your problem and look at it in the big scheme of things and say, you know what? It's not going to kill me. I also tell people to, to ask themselves that if they're afraid of doing something, ask yourself, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? When the company that I was running with my ex-husband, uh, when it was about to go under, I'd always wondered what's going to happen that day when I don't have money for payroll and I don't have money to pay the electric bill for the warehouse. What is going to happen? Am I going to die? I felt like I was going to die. That day came and guess what? I didn't die. I survived. It wasn't easy. It was tough, but I still survived. And so I look at a lot of those examples, and that is another thing that helps my mindset going forward. Uh, whatever I am nervous about or uh, anxious about, I always look at what is, what is the worst thing that can happen to me? If it's I get no or somebody doesn't respond to me, okay, I can deal with that. Uh, in my photography, when I am photographing brides and they're anxious before their wedding, I always tell them, expect something will go wrong. Expect something will go wrong. Because... Once you are okay with something going wrong, then you're not as anxious about it. Then it's been lifted off your shoulders. And that's the same way in life and in job search. Expect that no one's going to reply to you. Expect that you're not gonna get that interview. Just say, it's okay. If I don't get the interview, it's okay. But also think about yourself and think about what kind of person you are and how much you deserve that. And we're going to get into that more in just a moment. But we always have choices, and that's something that you need to recognize. You have choices each and every moment of the day. When we talked about mindset and consistent action, mindset combined with that consistent action helps you form habits. Habits help you show up every day. So let's take that weight loss program, for example. If you go out and you walk a mile every day, after three or four days, maybe you don't want to go and walk that day. And you suddenly realize, I have a choice. I can go and walk or I can not walk. And you decide to go and walk. So you're still being consistent. But say three weeks from now, when that thought enters that maybe you, you can't go walking again, you've already formed this habit, habit of showing up every day to walk that habit then reinforces you. The other thing is that motivation from mindset and consistent action, those days that you don't want to show up, that you don't want to do something because you're unmotivated to do it, the habit that propels you to consistently do the action anyway helps you get motivated. You know, have you ever had those days when you didn't want to get up and do something, you dreaded doing it, you went ahead and did it anyway, and by the end of whatever it is you were doing, you had a little bit more energy, you had a little bit more motivation. So motivation can come from actually doing the action. So many people think, well, I'm going to wait till I'm motivated to do it before I do it. But that's the wrong way of looking at it. The mindset should be, I need to do it anyway. I need to be consistent. And when I show up consistently, the motivation will then come. Because we're not motivated each and every day. I'm not motivated each and every day. I don't wake up and, and happy and energetic. Well, I mean, for the most part I do. But typically, I'm not always motivated and energetic. Tuesdays when I teach a really, long, a really long class all day long, I have to be motivated for my students. I have to get up every day, and I have to be motivated for them. Because what I have found about people in job search, and the people I teach are typically 40 to 60, with at least a college degree, if not a master's or a PhD, is that the biggest problem in job search is mindset and motivation. Mindset. It affects everything that you do in job search. And so if I want to make sure that I'm there to motivate everyone, including you guys today, I have to be ready to go. I have to, be, I have to put myself into that mode where I've got to get up and get motivated so that I can show up for you guys each and every day. Habits form from consistent action, and those habits help the motivation come when you are unmotivated to do something. So let's talk about types of mindset. 
there are two types of mindsets. You have the first one, which is a fixed mindset. And that's, those are those people that say, no matter what, I can never do that. Or no matter what, I'm not qualified for that. Or no matter what, that will never happen to me. You've heard those people? How many of you have heard people that have said that? Or maybe you have said it yourself. If you have, let's comment in the, the, the chat box. I'd love to hear from you guys if you have felt that way at any time that you just couldn't do something because you weren't experienced enough or maybe didn't have uh, what it took to do that. How many of you out there, just, just, just put yes or no. Yes, you felt it. No, you haven't. Just so that I know you guys are out there and alive and breathing and watching. Uh, my husband says that seldomly, okay? Um, anybody else out there? Yes. I have. I felt that way. Yes. Yes. Yes, I felt that. Yes. Yes, it's very typical. It is a very typical thing. So the fixed mindset is really those people that believe that no matter what you do, nothing is going to change. Okay. Now, the other mindset is the growth mindset. And that is the mindset that believes with a little bit more experience, I can do that. With a little bit more practice, I can do that. With a little bit more help, I can do that. The growth mindset is the mindset that says, I can do that. I just need a little bit more. What are those things that I can do? That's the growth mindset. So if you look at any person, and let's use John Morant. Let's use him. Actually, let's use Penny Hardaway. Okay, let's talk about him for a second. Any superstar in athletics or anybody in any type of success whatsoever got there because they had a growth mindset. They had to. They had to believe in themselves enough that even in the times that were really tough, even in the times where things were not going well, that they still persevered, that they still saw that there was the possibility out there. And I think that's the best way to explain it is that you look at it as there's a possibility out there. Now, can you change mindset? Yes, you can. You don't always have to have a fixed mindset. You can change that. You can change it in yourself and you can change it with others. It's, for some people, it's easier to do. For some, it's not as easy to do, but it's possible because mindset is not, it's not in your DNA. It's in your mind, really, no pun intended there. It's in your mind. And with a little rework, the first thing, the first thing to do is to recognize that you have a fixed mindset and then go about the ways to start changing that. And it's not a magic pill that you take and it just suddenly makes you change your mind. It's not like that, but it is, it is changeable. It is achievable to have a growth mindset. There actually was, um, there's a book and I'll talk about that in a sec. I'll talk about that at the end of class. I'll give you uh, the name of the book, but there was a book I read about mindset and it talked about the very first chapter is about, um, these researchers and they took um, elementary school kids and they set up this puzzle in a, in a room and they sent each child in there to try and solve the puzzle and then they interviewed each child as they came out and the children as they came out some would say oh i hated that experience i could not figure it out and i never want to do it again other children came out and they said oh my god i didn't figure it out but how soon can i go back in to try again so the kids that hated it and never wanted to do it again had a fixed mindset. The ones that wanted to try it again and learn from what they had already not done well had a growth mindset. So those are the first things in figuring out. It's also in your speech, figuring it out. But mindset can, yes, it definitely can be changed. Here's a great example. If you think or say, I can't, whatever okay instead ask yourself how can i so that's literally using your words to change your mindset so i routinely in my job search class that i teach i routinely hear people say oh i can't do that that i, I i'm not experienced enough 
I, ca I can't, I couldn't possibly email that person. I couldn't possibly call that person. And then they'll give me their, their, their reasons why not. And I say, how can you do that? How can you? I was following, I was listening to a podcast uh, back at the beginning of the year, I think like in January. And this lady talked about how every quarter for a year, she wrote down a list of 25 things that she wanted to fail at or try to fail at 25 things. So it was a hundred over the course of the year. One of those things was I want to make a pitch to uh, the today show because she was uh, some type of media personality and she wanted to make a pitch. Did she think that she would be selected for that pitch? She didn't think so, but she wanted to try it anyway so that she could learn from the process. When I started my first podcast, I literally started it on a Friday night, literally started it on a Friday night. And the reason I started it was because I meet all these people, all these ordinary people that have all these interesting stories that have overcome or do these amazing things. And they don't think they're that amazing. And I wanted a place to share it. And my photography blog and my travel blog really didn't seem like they were the right place. And I'd always been fascinated about podcasts because I like to talk in case you didn't know. So I literally started my podcast on a Friday night. And it wasn't that I said, I can't do that. I looked at how can I do that? Now, my first podcast was, was not great. I'd already recorded it, uh, an interview on a Facebook Live. But it was kind of messy. But you guess what? The next time I did the podcast, I learned from what I didn't like from the first one. And I still changed it. Three or four podcasts later, I still changed it. I'm still learning. I'm still improving on what I'm doing. So instead of saying, I can't do that, I don't have the technology, I don't have the experience. I don't have anybody that's going to listen to me. Instead, I said, how can I make it happen? That's all you got to do. You just got to figure out how to make it happen. You may not be a huge success, but what you may do is you may learn something. You may have happiness. You may have joy. You may enjoy failing. I asked a lady when in one of my classes or the motivation class I was teaching and I was asking them what they had failed at recently. And she spoke up and she said, I actually had always wanted to belly dance. And so I went and took a belly dancing class and she's smiling and she said, I was horrible at it. Horrible, awful, had no rhythm whatsoever. But it was the best time I had had in years. And I said, are you going to go back to that belly dancing class? And she says, yes, I am. I'm horrible at it, but I don't care because I so enjoy trying. So whenever you say I can't or someone else says I can't. So I believe there was a, one lady that said her husband says that a lot. The next time he says I can't look at him and say, honey, how can you do it? Let's and say it as as a we say, how can we how can I help you do that? How can we figure out how you can do this? I started my photography business with a camera. I did not know the exposure triangle. I didn't know anything. I had a good in, intuition about how to pose people, but I didn't know all the technical aspects of it. And did I mess up? Yes. I messed up a lot. God help me. I figured out how to fix those mess ups, but I did mess up. But I also learned as I went along and I learned more from my failures, from messing up, from making mistakes than I did from being perfect at something. So when I wanted to do a photography business and I said, I don't have a studio, I instead said, how can I still take clients? When I moved from Houston to Memphis, and I know right now photography is a luxury item. I am still going to try to have photo shoots. I'm not going to have a studio because my specialty now is outside experiences, shooting on location. I'm a natural light photographer. I shoot, I create magazine style photo shoots for everyday people. And so that's going to be my thing. I'm not going to try to do the studio, but I looked at how can I just show up and make great portraits for my clients. So 
what actually was my limitation, I actually turned around and used it as my strength. And I created a distinctive style that my photography emulates. So those are, so yes, whenever you say I can't or you hear somebody else say I can't, then just change it around very nicely and say, how can I do that? How can you do that? How can we help each other do that? Mindset and motivation play a huge factor in self-confidence. So self-confidence is how you feel about your abilities and how that can vary from situation to situation. Some people may be excellent at one thing and horrible at another thing. I can't sing. I'm not even going to attempt to say that I can sing, but I'm confident in my photography skills. So my self-confidence in one is higher than my self-confidence in the other one. Now, self-confidence is also a habit that can be learned. So if you look at your mindset with consistent action, that will also help you create self-confidence. The more you do something, the more you learn from your mistakes, the more you try, the more you get used to it, the more confident you are going to feel about what you do. Self-esteem, on the other hand, this refers to how do you feel about yourself overall. And a lot of self-esteem is really from our horrible childhood. I mean, I mean, most people, if they can get through high school, they should be lucky because high school can be it, have the biggest effect on your self-esteem ever, junior high school especially. But self-esteem refers how you feel about yourself overall, and this develops from the experiences and the situations that have shaped how you view yourself today. You can also change your self-esteem. You can improve your self-esteem by not listening to other people. If people tell you that you don't do something right, just turn them off. Just turn them off. Don't listen to them. Forge your own path and just put blinders on like a horse. So don't wait until you're confident to show up. Show up until you're confident. When I did my first live video or I did my first video post on Facebook, I literally recorded it 30 times. I'm not lying. I did 30 videos. I didn't like any of them. And finally, I just said, I'm wasting my time. I'm just going to stick it up. And it is what it is. And then the next time I did the video, I was, I was a little bit more comfortable because I was used to looking at myself. I was used to the aspect of feeling awkward. The next time I did it, I didn't necessarily have to have any notes. The next time I did it, I didn't have to record as many trials. The next time I did it, if I flubbed, I didn't care. I was still professional, but I was showing up and each time I showed up, each time I tried was giving me more confidence. See, the mistake that people make is thinking that I've got to be confident before I show up, before I attempt something. John Morant didn't start playing basketball after he was confident doing it. No, him showing up every day, practicing over and over and over gave him the confidence to show up again and again. Kobe Bryant, when I believe it was his rookie year, that he missed those shots at the end of, I don't know all the stats, but the end of one of like the playoff games and cost them the game, he went to the basketball gym afterwards and shot, I believe it was 1,000 free throws over and over and over again. Repetitive action brings you that confidence. So don't be one of those people that are like, I can't do that because I'm not good at it yet. Enjoy the process of attempting to be good at it. Embrace the aspect of enjoying that process of laughing, of showing up and learning, because you're going to learn more from not being perfect than you ever will from being perfect. How does all of this play a role in job search? Mindset and job search. The very first thing I'm going to tell you is that know your strengths. If you want a different job, if you want a job, if you're currently looking for a job, how many of you, let's hear that in the chat box, how many of you are currently unemployed? If you are, just put a yes in the chat box or a no. I want to see how many people are currently unemployed and looking for a job and how many people, um, okay, We've got two yeses and a no. We've got some, another no. 
Okay, good. Okay, so we've got about a 50-50 split there, I think. Okay, so mindset in job search, it affects everything you do. If you think that you're not going to get the job, you're not going to get the job because it's going to ooze from you. It's going to ooze in how you, how many people you contact. It's going to affect uh, what type of jobs you apply for. It's going to affect how many jobs you apply for because literally in your head, you're thinking, I can't do that. I'm not qualified to do that. So why even try? Why not try? See, it takes as much energy to say yes as it does to say no. It takes as much energy to believe you can as to believe you can't. So why not use the one that's going to be more beneficial to you? So know your strengths. It's important that you know your strengths. And I hear people all the time saying, uh, I'm organized. I'm a team player. Those aren't your strengths. Look at, look, if you don't know what your strengths are, then ask somebody. Listen to what other people say about you. One of my strengths is that I have the ability to talk to anybody about anything and make them feel comfortable, not talk down to them. And that was something I learned. I'm not embarrassed by that. I'm proud of that. And I look at ways that I can use that. But think, look, I would say, nail down three of your strengths. So if you're good at accounting, maybe you're really good at the general ledger. Maybe you're really good working with people. Maybe you're very creative. Write down three strengths that you have that you think are your prime three. And those are what you should focus on. Think about those and focus on that and know that you're good. And if you have to write them down, I'm all about writing things down so that you can visually see them every single day. Number two, find the why behind your goals. Whatever your goal is, understand why you're going after that goal. Your goal may be about money. I want to make more money. Or it could be something like me. Why do I love photographing people? Because I love seeing the expression on their face when they see a beautiful picture of themselves. And I know that sounds corny, but every single time I see that, it reminds me of why I love what I do. Why do I love mindset and motivation? Why do I like to teach that? Because I love seeing people get excited and believe in themselves and go out and do it and do it again and be okay with it not working out perfectly. So know the why behind your goals. Number three, enjoy the process. I've talked about that. I talk about a lot in my classes that people in job search should be, they should actually feel kind of thankful. And I get a lot of ugly looks about that because us as adults, we go from maybe college to marriage to children and, and we're in those jobs and we may change jobs a couple of times, but if you're never unemployed, you never have that time to sit there and self-reflect from figuring out what am I doing now? Is this what I want to do? Or what is it I want to do in the future? So enjoy the process of figuring out what it is you want, remembering who you were and figuring out who you are now. Enjoy the process of learning new things, learning new tech skills, learning about LinkedIn, learning how to email people, learning how to call people, learning how to talk on video, learning how to public speak. Enjoy the process of figuring out who you are and where you want to go from now. Stay hungry. You know, that was the one thing my mom passed away four years ago. And even the last few years of her life, she taught herself how to use a computer. Uh, when she could no longer sit at her desk, we got her an iPad and she uh, would sit in her recliner every day and she would get on Facebook. She created her own page. She got on there. She talked to people. She looked at all of uh, me and my sister and my brother's Facebook pages. And she did all of that. And she taught herself. She never stopped wanting to learn. So that's what I'm saying, stay hungry. Always want more. Always want to learn more. I've been very thankful that my bosses I've had in the past always taught me that. Always learn more, be hungry for more, never settle for just being okay. So here's the book I was talking about, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success by Carol Dweck. Oh, that's how you say her last name. It's an easy read. It's a great book. Uh, it talks about life. It talks about sports. It talks about business, 
family, all different kinds of scenarios, but it also helps you understand mindset because it really is easy to change, but you also have to acknowledge that you need to change. So mindset, the new psychology of success, you can find it on Amazon or in, uh, I'm sure a local bookstore. Uh, you can also get the, um, what do you call it? The Kindle version of it. Okay. The key to everything, guys, the key to everything is you have to believe in yourself. That's the secret. You have to believe in yourself. That is the secret. So um, I'm going to take a few questions in just a second. So be getting your questions ready. The podcasts that I have are The Sandy Adams Show uh, and also A Southern Girls View with Sandy Adams. The Sandy Adams Show is I talk a lot about business. I talk a lot about uh, job search, how to show up online, LinkedIn, tips and tricks, uh, mindset, motivation. I share a lot about experiences from my growing up, from my businesses, and also from my mom. She taught me quite a bit. A Southern Girl's View, as I said, it's all about uh, ordinary people with interesting lives. You can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, Stitcher, and also from my website. Let's connect if you haven't already. I'd love to connect with you online. I'm on Instagram. I have three accounts. Uh, one is my social media. The next one's photography. And the third one is travel. I'm also in Facebook. Here they are as well. And then I, my LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you guys on LinkedIn. It's Sandy Adams Dash Studio because there's a lot of people with my name. Um, I have a YouTube channel that has great information about uh, photography, about social media, about job search, about LinkedIn specifically and showing up. And also my website, sandy-adams.com, um, gives you a link to all of my uh, businesses and my other websites. But if you want to look specifically at my social media, it's the socialatelier.com. Okay, guys, if you want to, uh, we want you to follow the University of Memphis on LinkedIn and Willie Clark, who's our career services manager. Uh, we also ask that you connect with him as well. So make sure that you go to LinkedIn after this webinar and connect with him. Okay, the next three classes coming up are Thursday, October 8th, the energy component, November 12th, what role direction plays, and December 10th, persistence is key. They are all online right now at Memphis, uh, the University of Memphis alumni page under events, and you can go ahead and register now. I'd love to see all of you plus more for those webinars, and they are from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay, guys, let's see those uh, questions. So Rodney says, is procrastination a form of confidence mindset or just fear of getting started doing something else? Procrastination is your fear of doing something. It's your fear of not being perfect. That is what procrastination is. And once you realize that it's okay not to be perfect or maybe it, and it is, and in some ways it is a form of mindset because you're fearful of something. You're fearful of not uh, being perfect. You're fearful of uh, maybe somebody making fun of you. Maybe you're fearful of how it will. You're uncomfortable with being imperfect. But procrastination, look at what you're doing and see why you don't like it. See what you're fearful of. Because when it comes down to it, it's fear of something. Something. If you can pinpoint why, then go ahead and give yourself permission to go ahead and do it. Um, that's really the key to it is really just analyzing that. But that's a great, great question there, Rodney. Thank you very much for that. Does anyone else have any other questions that you want to ask? We have about 12 minutes to go and I'll be happy to take those. Don't be shy because no question is dumb. Any question, you never know what other people are thinking and your question might actually help somebody else. Does anyone else have any more questions? So JMG said, I need a job with benefits only contract now. What, uh, what I would suggest is just keep, um, and JMG, are you on LinkedIn? If you are, then what I would tell you is to uh, definitely get on there and be, um, and be present on LinkedIn. Uh, okay, so Henry says, I procrastinate because I find myself comfortable under pressure. How do I get around that? You see, Henry, I do that that as well. I have a habit of doing that as well. And what I would um, what I would say is that figure out, make start making yourself, and that's when those habits come into play. Start start uh, making yourself do a little bit of it ahead of time. Give yourself those deadlines. It may take several times to get yourself in the habit of doing it ahead of time, but also remember how do you feel when 
you procrastinate and you like suddenly, I don't know about you, but when I procrastinate and I'm doing it the last moment, I get, I get sweaty and I feel, I get sick in my stomach and I'm like, oh my God, I should never have done this. So remind yourself of how you feel and then build in those things and really force yourself, even if it's to reward yourself. Figure out what is something little that you could reward yourself with if you do part, part of those things ahead of time and kind of space that out and maybe do one thing kind of at the last moment to give yourself that rush. But I definitely understand that, Henry. So Kay says, when you feel good about yourself but fear others will not accept. I have a podcast on that, actually, Kay. It's called Other People's Opinions Are None of Your Business or Other People's Opinions Don't uh, Pay Your Bills. What I would tell you is I had people that made fun of me because I literally, um, my camera, I had a short at a prime lens. And a lot of people, when they shoot, they use really long lenses to shoot portraits. That's the technical way you're supposed to do it. I just simply didn't care. I just simply said, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm going to stay in my own lane. So what I tell you is when write down what you feel good about and then start doing little things. Challenge yourself every week to do something that you don't care what other people are. Or even if you do care, go ahead and do it anyway. That's what I would challenge you, Kate, is to just to try it just to try little things either once a day or once a week that kind of challenge that so that that kind of makes you feel more comfortable with it. So Cheryl says, what tips can you give me regarding a second career? Well, Cheryl, that depends. What are, what are your strengths? What are your interests? Look at that. And if you can, just put those into the chat box. I'm happy to answer those. And the other thing, Kay, back to your question is, Always remember that the other people you fear will not accept you or may ridicule you. They have their own issues. Trust me, everybody, I don't care how old they are, they all have their issues. So you are not the only one. So all, always think, realize that they have their own issues and most of the time they're not even going to pay attention to you. And if they do, it's just because of their own insecurities, not your own. Uh, counseling and accounting. Cheryl, you could easily start teaching people how to set up their QuickBooks. You could help them set up uh, small business owners, uh, maybe just one or two people. Uh, a lot of the Mary Kay people, they may not know how, think of small, small people you can do one-on-one. -on -one. They may need tips on how to set up a general ledger. You could easily turn that into a little, even an online through Zoom business. That would be a great thing to do it. Um, that's pretty easy to do. QuickBooks can also, you can be certified in QuickBooks and, and do books remotely from your computer. But I would say teaching people how to set up their own books and maybe um, doing some of that on the side as well, finding two or three people, uh, because you don't necessarily now have to be in the same city and meet with people. With, with the internet and with things like that, you could easily do that. Does anyone else, I feel like I've been talking like crazy now. Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, I did show you this. So this, I told Willie I had a surprise for him. So this is my dog, Lucy. She's actually here on the floor. Um, she was one year old in this picture, I believe, that I took on campus. Um, so that was my little shout out to the University of Memphis. Uh, Kay says, what is a good way to find opportunities for work? I would say definitely you need to get on LinkedIn. Right now, LinkedIn is the most underutilized platform out there and get on there, set up your profile, be professional and, and educate people on what you do because you're not, you're not selling yourself. You're educating people on what you do. I encourage you to go and follow me and look at what I post on there. I educate people on the things that I teach on things about my business. And I'm not sitting there saying, I'm the best photographer, hire me. I am sitting there um, educating them on photography, on travel, on social media, on LinkedIn. I'm educating them. And people are finding me from LinkedIn. I'm still getting requests for work. So that's what I would tell you to do is get on there, connect with people. Don't just collect connections, but get on there and talk to people, have conversations. Because right now, there's never been a better time to be on LinkedIn than right now and anywhere on social media, that's for sure. So Sandeep says, um, thank you for this webinar. I want to know how to stop myself from doing the same self-destructive habits on a weekly basis, sleeping late, sabotaging sleep, not learning, 
uh, not learning from in-demand technologies like programming, being lazy, and finding a future self. What I'm going to tell you is start with one thing a day. One thing. My thing about me getting up in the mornings, I didn't used to really like it. I st I'm still not a morning person, but I got, I set up a routine. I started drinking coffee from a French press, and I know people laugh at me all the time, but I started doing that, and I enjoyed the habit of doing that. I enjoyed that habit, and I set up a habit doing yoga, doing that, getting up in the morning, and having my little routine, and that helped me. But what I would say is identify one thing you can do for five days straight. Pick one thing a week for five days straight. Remember, consistent action helps you form habits, and so that's what I would do. Uh, man, they're all coming now. Puzzle has an end result. Why does the unknown finished product or possibility make for an unrestful feeling? Um, it's because people are not uncomfortable. They're, they're uncomfortable with not solving that puzzle. And that goes back to that fixed or growth mindset. People that look at the challenge of it, not the end result. That's really, and that talks about the process, being comfortable with the process and not the end result. That's really what that puzzle um, having not necessarily having an end result. It's people, some people enjoy the process. And that's really what you need to look at is enjoying the process of whatever it is. Christian says, I get my motivation from other people rather than myself. So I seem approval constantly. How can I refocus that? Simply by taking one thing at a time and not and keeping yourself from looking at what other people are saying. Also, um, if you get your energy and stuff from, from that's more of an introvert perspective, then I would say, um, Willie, okay, you're going to send a new Zoom meeting for 215 for review if that's okay. Okay, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but okay. Um, I, miss, I lost my train of thought. Um, so I would take one thing a week and focus on that and not worry about what everybody else is saying. And once you realize they're more focused on themselves than on you, you're going to get more comfortable with that. Okay, guys, what is the best way to overcome past failures and prevent them affecting our positive mindset? Sit down and look at your past failures and really write out what you learned from them. Nothing is bad. Failures are great. They're a great way to learn. So sit down and look at your past failures and, and really analyze what did you learn from that. It's not a failure. It's a learning opportunity. And that's what you need to do. Keeping a journal every day is another great way of really assessing what you've done currently and looking back at what you wrote weeks ago, years ago. It's another great way. Um, Henry says, are you able to give a brief overview of the upcoming seminars? Yes, I can quickly. Hang on. Um, Man, guys, y'all were quiet until the very last moment. Uh, Kay, thank you for, I'm, I'm so excited to be back in Memphis. The energy component is all about your energy to keep, your energy to show up every day. That's really what we're going to talk about is your physical energy, your mental energy to show up every day. Um, the November 12th one, what role do direction plays is how to figure out that direction and how to know how to set yourself up with a goal, whatever that is, whether it's in job search or in life, is how to come up with that direction and stay on that course. And persistence is key, is really talking about how to, how to program yourself not to give up. That's really in a nutshell what the December 10th one is, is how not to give up. Um, okay, guys, anything else? Anything else, guys? I really, really, really would love for you. Okay, do you have a podcast on issues like self-discipline, saying no to my self-destructive impulses and pursuing my dreams? Go check out my website. And both of the podcasts are listed there. It's sandy-adams.com. And you can look at all of my um, podcasts. And if you have one that you would like to hear about, send me an e uh, email or connect with me on LinkedIn. And I would be glad to record one in the future, definitely. So I'm always looking for suggestions because I want to know what people would like to hear. Um. Okay, the next one, don't forget to go and register. They're all online now. You can register for all of the next three, October, November, and December. Um, and I would love to see you guys there. And please share uh, this as well. And don't forget to connect with me as well. I would love to see that. So I know you guys were asking me questions in the Q&A and also in the chat box. I appreciate so much you guys showing up every day for this webinar and I would love to hear feedback from you. So if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn or through social media, I'd love to hear what you loved about it. I'd love to know uh, what you'd like to hear from me in the future. If I wanna do a podcast, I'd love to hear that as well. 
Okay, guys, that's it for now. I'm ending at 159. Willie, I hope that's okay. Um, and that's kind of it. Okay, so, okay, guys, we're going to go have a wonderful weekend. Um, make sure Penelope was, Penelope is, I got to give her a shout out. She is one of, she's a friend of mine. She's also a client of mine. And I'm so sad I didn't get to say bye to you in person before I left Houston. But I'm so glad you joined us today. Erica, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you had such a great time. Tell everybody, share this. I'd love to have more people than ever on the next three uh, webinars that I give. And I'd love to connect with you guys on social media, LinkedIn, wherever that would be. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you so very much for sharing today.